Have you heard the latest horrible news about the Bible? A vicious robbery occurred. Memes lit up Facebook and other social media like a three-alarm fire declaring that our modern Bibles cannot be trusted. I get it. If the Bible has been corrupted, then what can we trust? Where can we turn if the devil or greedy godless publishers have poisoned our Bibles? Well, you've come to the right place. I'll tell you about it. It was good enough for Jesus and it's good enough for me. Anarchy, chaos, godlessness. The foundation of our faith is firm and dependable. Shalom, my name is Randy Weiss. I'm a Jewish believer in a Jewish Messiah. In Hebrew, his name is Yeshua HaMashiach. Now, most folks know him as Jesus Christ. I want you to know that Jesus is Lord and evil is such a nice Jewish boy. It's also important to understand that most everything we know about Jesus is learned from what we read in the Bible. If we have no trustworthy Bible, we have no dependable account of the Messiah in whom we have placed our trust. If the Bible is not dependable, our faith is unhinged. We have no anchor to hold us in the storm or to point us toward heaven. Do you get it? No Bible, no Jesus. No Jesus, no salvation. No forgiveness, no mercy, no law. That leaves anarchy, chaos, godlessness. Wait, <laughs> that's starting to sound like the direction our world is headed. Hmm. And that's why I decided to discuss this assault against our faith. Nobody poisoned my Bible. It is pure, refreshing, life-giving, and dependably accurate. But some folks are poisoning our faith by trying to imply our Bibles cannot be trusted. These attacks are coming from misinformed Christians, not from the enemy of our faith. Satan has figured out a creative way to pummel our faith without getting his hands dirty. Don't fall for such an insidious subversion. Unless you're reading an actual cult version of the Bible, you have no worries that the Bible you read cannot be trusted. There's nothing wrong with our Bibles. I wish Christians would stop impugning the integrity of all Bibles because they prefer one edition over the others. Listen to me. No translators of the New International Version of the Bible, the NIV, they didn't erase important verses or deleted words to water down the truth. To those who suggest they did, let me just say, slow your roll, cowboy. Please stop promoting nonsense that could cause weaker Christians to lose faith or drive off unbelievers who already think Christians are goofy to trust in Bibles that are all packed with horse bucky. Instead, learn enough to silence the critics and live your faith with an informed sense of confidence in the complete trustworthiness of the Bible. And we should all be better informed to provide factual correction when we hear accusations against the accuracy of the Holy Bible. Look, nothing has been removed from the NIV translation of the Bible. If the words were included in the most ancient original manuscripts, they remain in the NIV. Now, it may not be everybody's favorite version, but it is a highly accurate translation. Ignore the partial truths that just flood social media about Zondervan, the publisher of the NIV Bible. Yes, Zondervan is owned by HarperCollins. Yes, that parent company does publish some stupid books. Okay, so what? Don't read stupid books, read the Bible. HarperCollins has no input, no control, and certainly no involvement in the content of Zondervan's NIV Bible. My friends, follow me on this logic. Consider the Monsanto conglomerate. Monsanto produced the deadly herbicide Roundup. 
It kills weeds, trees, and makes other living stuff die. Yes, Monsanto makes some deadly stuff. But Monsanto also produces portions of your favorite products, such as Coca-Cola, Nabisco, Frito-Lay, Aunt Jemima, and Green Giant. Don't be an idiot. Drink Coke, not Roundup. And just to help some of you get over this social media headache, follow the money. Apparently, there's a lot of money in headaches and in Bibles. Did you know that the Bayer Aspirin Company now owns Monsanto? Just like the HarperCollins Company now owns Zondervan. Who cares? So when you hear that the NIV Bible has certain verses removed from it, don't freak out. It just means that it is different when compared to the King James Bible. Had you considered that maybe the King James Bible had a few words or verses added to the translation that were not in the most ancient original manuscripts? Hmm. Look, you can know with confidence that it is a false claim to suggest that these modern Bibles have dozens of verses erased or thousands of words deleted. Such sensational alerts are absolutely absurd. Yes, the King James Bible is slightly different than the NIV or many other more recent Bible translations. That does not make one right or the other wrong. It's important to understand what it does mean. The King James Bible was based on the most excellent translations of the very best, most ancient manuscripts available to scholars in the 1500s. The 1611 edition of the Bible in the King's English is perhaps the greatest book ever published. It probably brought more change to the world than any other book ever put into print. And the translators who produced this monumental divine work depended on the best materials known to man at that time. But since that time, many more ancient manuscripts were discovered. For example, it wasn't until after the 1940s that the world learned about the Dead Sea Scrolls. As more older, more ancient manuscripts are discovered, the science of Bible translation continues to improve. In this regard, the older manuscripts are considered to be the better examples. You see, the more ancient the source material, the closer those older manuscripts are to the actual event described in the material. Therefore, in the world of Bible translations, the newer translations have the possibility of being better because the newer translations have access to the oldest original source material manuscripts. So, why do so many new versions of the Bible exist? <laughs> well, the King's English is not the English spoken by most people today. In fact, the English spoken in the 1500s was not easily understood by Christians in the 1800s or 1900s. That was why various Bible societies and translation organizations have always been providing new translations of the Bible in the languages of the people that are both accurate and understandable. And it is why more modern translations have become so popular among people young and old. Look, some folks find Shakespearean English to be awkward instead of beautiful. Likewise, others feel the King James Bible is simply too difficult to understand. Now, none of this should cause anyone dyspepsia if one prefers a version that ditches the, the these, thines, and thous to study God's words with a more modern phrasing that can communicate the exact same precise, accurate words and meanings. Remember, neither the King James Bible or any English Bibles are read in the languages 
in which they were originally written. But I promise you, we can be confident that the translators remained faithful to the content of the original manuscripts. And if there is a legitimate difference between a modern version and an older edition, whereby it appears that a verse or a word is missing, most good study Bibles footnote these slight differences. The details are explained by the facts, included without apology. If it is a well-known fact that some more ancient manuscripts contain a few less words or fewer phrases, well, that simply means that a few more words and a few more phrases were incidentally added to some later manuscripts. This was likely centuries after the originals. Such minor later editions were probably inserted by scribes and were never included in the original manuscripts. Therefore, a good study Bible will simply note the additions and inform the reader from which later manuscripts the edition originated. These things are known, they're well known by the Bible translators. Deleted words are usually added in italics or included in the footnotes with careful explanation. There's no secrets here, no conspiracies. Simple biblical literacy and a bit of biblical historiography easily resolves the, the bloated concerns that often drive headlines on social media. Personally, I still read and enjoy the King James Version. But I also look to numerous other versions in my studies. <laughs> they are not all the same, but they are all wonderful. I, I agree that some translations are preferred over others, but apart from the Watchtower Bibles or one delivered along with the Book of Mormon, you can be confident that just about any version a person reads is much preferred over the one gathering dust on a coffee table or stuck on a bookshelf. For the record, I am opposed to scaring people away from the Bible, implying they are untrustworthy. That is the devil's job, not ours. And since most people are unable to read the Bible in the original languages, I'm confident that almost any modern translation is a wonderful alternative to ungodly skepticism. Allow me to propose a, a simple example. While I was writing my notes for this message, a terrible storm hit. Had I communicated details about that event in written words, I would have said, it's raining cats and dogs out, outside of my office. And it was, it was terrible. If my English words were to be translated by someone a thousand years from now, would I be understood to have communicated? It was raining very, very hard. The correct literal translation of my words would cause readers to assume animals were falling from the sky. My peers today would certainly understand it was just a very, very heavy rain. But in another culture, another language, or at a time in the distant future, centuries from now, when such an idiom might not make sense, some might wrongly assume house pets came from the heavens. Similarly, ancient idioms, ancient languages, and ancient writers, well, they would probably appreciate modern translators helping us to understand what stuff means in the lingua franca, today's language. We can all be helped by the excellent translators and the dedicated linguists who love God and His Word. So what do you say when one of your friends declares, the Bible was written by men. It's not really the Word of God because it has too many mistakes in it. After this program, you should have no need to be concerned when that happens. And you should be equipped to explain the crucial facts to others. So let's consider the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. These strange words just mean that the Bible 
in its original manuscripts is accurate and free from error. Along with most conservative Christians, I believe the Bible is the Word of God from God. And I believe you can believe it to be certain and true. Oh, please don't ignore the qualifier in its original manuscripts, or as they're often described, the original autographs. In a nutshell, that defines the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. You see, my faith is built on the foundation of believing in a Bible that is accurate, trustworthy, inspired by God, and preserved with excellence through the generations. The Bible is the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. Once again, don't ignore the qualifier and don't be naive. Scholars in our camp of conservative believers only accept the original autographs in their original languages as perfect. As you prepare to do battle on the field of biblical inerrancy, Please don't act like so many unlearned critics who have been embarrassingly ignorant on this subject. Get your facts straight and the truth will carry your argument. Then you can leave the emotional outbursts to knuckleheads who depend on volume because they don't have facts. You know, you, you never convince a skeptic with volume. You disarm him with facts and silence him with the truth. Don't be that guy that says, my King James Bible is the inerrant Word of God. It was good enough for Jesus and it's good enough for me. <laughs> I trust that you know that the New Testament church did not have a New Testament. Look, it was not canonized as we know it until centuries after Jesus. As I like to remind folks, when Jesus and the disciples quoted from the Bible, these were Jewish guys reading from the Jewish scriptures. They had no New Testament, and even their Jewish Bible was often a Greek translation from the original Hebrew. It's known as the Septuagint. And I might also mention that the Septuagint used by Jesus would have been considered a modern version of the Bible of that era for Greek-speaking Jews. Awkward? Not at all. And this fact might help us all better understand the foolishness of the false accusations against modern translations. Even way back then, some Jews may have had a better grasp of the language spoken around the gym than that which would have been quoted from the Hebrew Torah scrolls unrolled in the synagogue. What we might think of as modern problems with Bible translations is actually an age-old issue. But since they truly were good enough for Jesus and his buddies, I suggest we make allowances for modern translations in our day. And for my King James only friends, you might be interested in knowing that King James himself was a despot. You know, during the 17th century, he persecuted the Puritans and drove them out of England. You remember the story about the Puritans coming to America seeking religious freedom? Well, King James was one of the bad guys in that story, not the good guy. I still enjoy his authorized version but I love all good Bibles that are based on the original autographs from the original languages of ancient Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And contrary to some of the foolish, inflammatory, erroneous memes on social media, our English versions of the Bible, along with most good paraphrases, are excellent and inspirational. By the way, have you noticed that nobody questions the validity of the ancient Greek classic, the Iliad? Most world literature classes requires reading either Homer's famous work, the Iliad, or the Odyssey. Homer's work has 643 ancient Greek manuscripts to ensure the world of its accuracy. We know what Homer wrote. 
nobody complains about Homer or doubts the authenticity of what he wrote. But when compared to our New Testament, 643 manuscripts puts Homer in a very distant second place for verification purposes. You should be proud to know that we have nearly 6,000 ancient Greek manuscripts which contain all or parts of the New Testament. Comparisons of these ancient manuscripts conclusively prove the incredible accuracy of our New Testament. Not only do we know precisely what the apostles wrote, we also know in which ancient scriptoriums the vorlage were produced. Those are a couple of extra 50 cent words thrown in for free, but you might enjoy knowing them for the purposes of this discussion. A scriptorium was where ancient texts were translated and copied. Vorlage is another great word to remember. It will disorient your neighborhood skeptic because he might not know a biblical vorlage from a pizza parlor. The problem is unless you arm yourself with the truth, even an uneducated skeptic could make you look silly. Anyhow, the vorlage are the texts from which our various translations were made. The best manuscripts came from the scriptoriums at Alexandria, Egypt. They also produced the Septuagint, which as we all now know, was the Greek translation of the Old Testament used by Jesus. Jesus also spoke Hebrew and Aramaic, but the Septuagint was a well-respected version of the Bible in his day. Now, without question, the Alexandrian scribes followed the most professional ancient Jewish scribal methods. In fact, they were staffed with trained philologists. Yes, that's another great word worth mentioning because those fellows were necessary for ensuring the accuracy of preserving our Bible. Philologists were those experts trained in ancient languages. My friends, this was serious, holy, detailed work done by dedicated, well-trained, well-equipped, totally committed individuals focused on doing their work perfectly. In Syria at Antioch, a Christian named Lucian developed a more casual edition, which became the standard version for the Byzantine text. The Eastern Orthodox Church continued using this Greek version, known as the Textus Receptus, from where we get our King James Version. However, unlike many of the meme warriors, I would never claim that it's the best translation. In fact, the discoveries of Alexandrian manuscripts do offer better workmanship. And that is why I read several translations for study and devotional purposes. In fact, one of my print Bibles contains the significant differences from 26 major translations. For my normal daily study, which I prefer, my, uh, my, parallel, my parallel version... I have simple access to the New International Version, the New Living Translation, the New King James Version, and the Message, which is a paraphrase. But I always have my King James Version and the Living Bible close at hand because, you see, here's the thing. You, you can forget about all of those abbreviations or my personal habits, but you can be confident that whatever English translation you select, Stand confident in God's ability to reach you and teach you from His Holy Word. And if you still wonder if we can trust the accuracy of the Bible, here's a statistic that should give you an unshakable confidence. Even if we didn't have those 6,000 copies of ancient Greek manuscripts, we could reproduce the entire New Testament from the writings of the early church fathers. You see, we have over 36,000 early patristic quotations from the Bible, the writings of the church fathers. 36,000 
ancient patristic quotations from the Bible which help us verify the accuracy of our New Testament. Please, understand what this means. Long before the Bible was completed, long before the scriptures were canonized, the earliest leaders of nascent Christianity preserved an enormous body of carefully detailed summaries, analyses, and expositions of what they had personally heard from the apostles or read from their original manuscripts. From their own first-hand explanations and writings, these men quoted directly from the most ancient, authentic Greek writings. Therefore, we can know with confidence what was written in the original autographs. And even if we did not have the evidence from those sections of the 6,000 ancient Greek manuscripts, the entire New Testament could be reconstructed and accurately conveyed to us from the vast array of ancient written teachings, sermons, and books by the preachers who taught the earliest Christians the truth about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And their ancient writings have been faithfully preserved. Allow me to repeat this. Simply by citing the verbatim quotes of the original manuscripts within their 36,000 ancient quotations, we could effectively reproduce the precise words of the entire New Testament. We can all give thanks to the earliest teachers of Christianity for this spectacular service provided to mankind. And because of them, we can be filled with confidence that the foundation of our faith is firm and dependable. As Dr. Philip Comfort has authoritatively stated, not one fundamental Christian doctrine rests on a disputed reading of a New Testament manuscript. In other words, if you stand on the word, you'll never fall. The New Testament can be trusted. I realize that there are still many questions that some folks might want answered. For example, why do some legitimate differences exist in certain versions? How come some Bibles have more books in them than others? Why do Catholic Bibles contain the Apocrypha and Protestant Bibles don't? What about books mentioned in the New Testament that cannot even be found in the Bible, like the book of Enoch? I mean, what's that about? These general topics are important, yet they're often overlooked. And sadly, well, there's just much more than can be crammed into a single episode. So I must ask you to join us for our next Crosstalk program to answer these and other questions about the integrity of our Holy Bible. Or you could just take a look at our Crosstalk YouTube channel where this and so much more information lives. I hope you'll take a moment to like and subscribe to it where everything will be posted. Also, please listen to our In Studio with Randy Weiss podcast. Yeah, I'm Randy Weiss. Everything is free and it's all available 24-7. You can also visit our website, crosstalk.org, or write to me directly, randy at crosstalk.org. Till next time, shalom.